Hello, and welcome to our AI Lab Hot Item. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Brian Williamson, London-based partner of the consultancy Communications Chambers. His clients include governments, regulators, telcos, and tech companies. And he has a background in economics and physics. The reason? A series of AI policy documents and declarations issued in the US, the UK, and by the G7. Let's hear what Brian has to say. Before I get to AI, um, I'll start with a bit of economic history of technology, and I think it is informative in thinking about AI. So previous general purpose technologies, steam, electricity, and computing had wide ranging applications and delivered substantial benefits overall. Um, and yet the path on which they developed was unpredictable. Um, the applications were not obvious at the outset the benefits were not obvious and the risks were not obvious. To give one example, James Watt's steam engine was patented in 1769, but it took until 1804 for rail to be developed. Um, it would have been futile to attempt to make the application of steam safe, secure and trustworthy in 1769. We didn't know what the applications were. Um, so the other point I'd make about each of those technologies is the, the potential harms are arguably a counterpart of having a powerful and useful technology. And a simple example of that is a, a sharp knife. Um, a sharp knife is both useful and dangerous um, and is used to produce harm in the wrong hands. But a blunt knife would be safe, but not useful. And I think that's just an inherent characteristic of powerful technologies. Uh, you, you can't make them inherently safe. So I'll just turn to um, what I think are some of our cognitive constraints when we think about technology and you see these patterns emerging in, in discussion of past innovation. One is that prediction is, I think, often, if not typically wrong. And, and that's when it comes to the details. We might be able to predict some of the broad points, but the details we don't get right. Um, an example was Marconi, who said that the wireless, he invented the wireless, would make war impossible. That was, um, that didn't turn out to be the case. Um, and I think that's fairly typical. And in particular, often the people who develop the technologies are least able to make sensible predictions about what will happen. Um, the other cognitive trap, I think, is the tendency to focus on new technology itself rather than focusing on problems and, and adopting a kind of technology neutral approach to regulation. Um, and I'll give an example of, of what was a new technology at the time, which was public libraries. Uh, people argued against um, the funding and introduction of public libraries in the United Kingdom in 1850, at least some people did, on the grounds that libraries could give rise to unhealthy social agitation. Um, I just don't think that was the right way to think about it. It's possible that they did, did give rise to some social agitation that may have been healthy or unhealthy. Um, and I think it's also interesting that public libraries contain material that is dangerous. Uh, there are books on chemistry, physics, biology that could be used to develop weapons of mass destruction, for example. They contain a lot of information that today we would consider false. And they contain a lot of information that um, judged by today's norms, we would consider biased. But we decided to go all in and to, to give the public access to public libraries. And I think that was the right thing to do. Um, turn, turning to large language models, you can kind of think of them as, as an approximate intelligent library. And I think so therefore we have to be careful um, in a sense to keep our heritage intact. And, and sure, we need to guard against bias in certain applications or against misinformation. But I think it would be futile to try and to try to remove all of that material from the training data. That just wouldn't be a, a practical way of thinking about it. Um, so I'll now turn to the, the global focus on the regulation of AI um, and kind of contrast that with other general purpose technologies. So the, the European <clears throat> Union is working to agree a law for AI. Um, but part of the challenge there is that the, the perceived challenges continue to evolve as does the technology. So that's, that's a difficult thing to do, but I actually think it's the wrong thing to do at this point in time, if ever. Um, the UK put out a 
consultation document some time ago that focused on relying on existing regulation in the first instance and, and the evolution of existing regulation. Um, and to make that, to put that into kind of a practical context, I see that recently the Bank of England, for example, have consulted industry on what are the implications of AI for the way in which we regulate financial services. So that, that's accepting that we have regulation that applies to AI um, or any other way of producing a service. <clears throat> but we may need to think about how we ensure compliance. Um, that's a sensible discussion to be having, and they, they are doing that. But the other thing the UK recently had last week was a um, an AI summit which focused on frontier risk. Um, personally, I'm not sure that it's obvious that, that that's a meaningful kind of concept, frontier risk in relation to AI. It, it's poorly defined. Um, and I just think that AI probably isn't the key consideration in, to, in relation to some of the risks that were talked about there, including chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. It's not really knowledge that's the constraint on those things. It's um, motivation and the ability to actually um, construct them, if you like. The knowledge is available in other ways. And AI is really only compressing and making available knowledge that already exists at the moment. Um, the White House published an executive order last week, and um, one objection to that that some have made is there's no real due process. It isn't obvious how the White House came to some of the decisions in there. Uh, there's no process of consultation. Um, some of the things it does, it sets an arbitrary compute threshold for regulation, and that causes concern in the open source community that they might not be able to continue to innovate beyond that threshold without regulation. It's not obvious how that would work for open source. Um, it proposes quite extensive regulation of what's referred to as dual use AI, so where it crosses over into military applications. I think the difficulty with that is that AI is inherently a multi-purpose -pur technology uh, and almost any AI could be used in a, in a kind of dual use manner. Um, so that's potentially very wide ranging in its application. <clears throat> it also defines AI in a way that is so broad. Um, when I thought about it, it covered an analog thermostat, you know, of last century, because that's a device that can, um, has human inputs, um, senses the environment and makes a decision about whether to turn a boiler on or not. So, um, it's difficult to define a AI in a useful way. It's, it's a very broad category of things. Okay. And lastly, I'll just mention China. Um, China is regulating or proposing to regulate AI. And I think the evidence is that China is going to struggle to reconcile the rapid development of AI with a high degree of centralized control, particularly in the current era um, where the models involve speech in particular. Um, Oh, so now come on to what should we do? So I, I don't think much of what we are doing is really the right way to go about it. And it's not the way we went about it with other general purpose technologies. We didn't, we didn't seek to regulate computing or have a law of computing. We, we did focus on particular problems that arose over time and, and computing um, led to a focus on data protection. But that's different to having a law of computing. That's saying we've got a particular problem around data protection. Let's think about how we address that. And I think that's that's the approach we should follow with AI. Focus on, on genuine problems that aren't covered sufficiently by existing regulation. So what should we do? We should not seek a law of AI, in my opinion. Um, not now, possibly not ever. Um, I'd leave that possibility open, but I, I can't see why you would want a law of AI as such. We should recognize that markets will adapt. Um, and for example, markets do develop ways of helping consumers to sort the trustworthy from the untrustworthy. That's just one example. It's, it's never perfect, but, but um, there is a market opportunity if you can convince people your service is more trustworthy than alternatives, um, then that's valuable. Existing regulation will adapt. I've mentioned the Bank of England, Ofcom have also published a consultation in the UK on how to adapt um, to AI in the regulation of broadcasting and telecom services. So I think that the onus there is on regulators to think about, does anything in, in the way they enforce existing regulation need to change and to, to have a dialogue with industry? 
Um, the next point is that AI itself is likely to be part of the counter to AI harms. And cybersecurity is an example where it may be that AI systems are one of the only effective ways of dealing with um, AI-based attacks on systems. And what that tells you is that there's quite a big risk if you fall behind the people who have access to the technology and want to do harm. Um, so if we hold back the development of AI, I think that exposes us to greater, not less risk. My last point is that if we do find um, we need more than those adaptations allow to address problems, then we should remain technology agnostic and focus on um, delivering a solution. And by technology agnostic, I mean uh, not just across different um, software, for example, but also including humans. We are the competing um, information processing system, if you like. So let's say uh, we decide we want to put greater limits on um, surveillance of the public, and that's that's a, a hot issue. Um, uh, surveillance is old, but AI enables you to do more of it and more than most people might think was uh, socially desirable. But if we are going to limit surveillance, I don't think that should be a limitation on AI as such. It should be a, a limitation on surveillance. Um, so you, you need to come back from AI and say, yes, that's amplified something we have a concern about, but what's the solution that um, isn't focused on AI as such, but is focused on the problem? Um, so just to repeat, I, I don't think we need a law of AI. We need to do the hard work um, of thinking about whether existing regulation and, <clears throat> and market adaptation is going to be sufficient. Um, and, and that's a detailed ongoing problem that um, will be focused on for decades. Um, but just trying to fix the problems now with a law in advance won't work. And back to the steam age, um, we couldn't have anticipated the need for railway safety at the time steam was developed. Uh, that came much later. And I think it, that is exactly how our AI will play out. There will be issues, but we, we don't know what they are at, the, at this moment. Um, so that's all. Well, thank you, Brian. I think, um, yeah, I, policymaking is supposed to be uh, about providing solutions to problems that you have identified and that you have consulted on. So I'm pretty sure policymakers would agree with you, but you know, it's such a beautiful, shiny thing at the moment, AI, that everyone wants to uh, say their bit. And, and um, going back to your dual use um, um, reference, uh, that makes me think that the internet, after all, started in a very military context and ended up being something we all use on a daily basis. So uh, as you said, sometimes it's difficult to predict uh, what will happen to an invention or to a new technology or to the use of an old technology in new ways. Um, thank you so much, Brian, for your contribution and um, look forward to your further thoughts when you write uh, about AI and other topics. Thank you. Thank you.